much for joining. Thank you very much, Father, uh, for that kind introduction. One small correction. Uh, I was the chair of the Labour Club in Cambridge, not association. <laughs> Conservatives have associations, socialists have clubs. That's the distinction. Uh, it is an honour to be here. As always, the difficulty of speaking immediately after a mass is that the priest is essentially saying to you, follow that. And that's actually impossible, but I will do my best. I was asked this evening if I would give a talk on the subject of thy kingdom come. And this request was made many, many months ago. I wasn't quite sure what the title meant or what I was expected to say. But then, by sheer coincidence, the country fell apart and an election was called. So it makes sense to talk about politics and the ambition of building heaven on earth. Many have tried to do this. Every single attempt has been a failure, which leads me to ask, is it possible to build heaven on earth? Is it even desirable to try? The question I have set myself for this talk is this. What is the correct relationship between Christians and politics in the 21st century? As per usual, uh, scripture speaks eloquently for itself. In the book of John, chapter 18, Jesus is captured by the Jews and is taken to see Pilate, the governor of Judea. The Jews demand that Jesus be executed under Roman law on the grounds that Jesus claims to be a king and that this is a direct threat to the authority of the emperor. Pilate interrogates Jesus and what follows is a magnificent battle of wits. Pilate asked Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea, Jesus asked, or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew, Pilate replied. Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it that you have done? Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Pilate retorted, what is truth? Here we have the absolutely definitive conversation between a theologian and a politician. Jesus, the theologian, says he is here to speak the truth with a capital T. Pilate, the politician, asks, what is truth? I want you to remember that scene during this talk, and I will return to it towards the end. The postmodern world of 2019, the world that you and I inhabit, really began in 1989 with the collapse of communism and the triumph here in Britain and across the world of Margaret Thatcher's brand of conservative individualism. This was the defeat of the politics of we, of socialism, the masses and the collective, a collective attempt to build heaven on earth, and it was the victory of I. Mrs Thatcher did not believe that it was the job of the government to build heaven, but it was the vocation of the individual to try to achieve salvation on their own terms. She was not, I want to stress, irreligious. On the contrary, you could argue that the politics of 20th century Britain had been a battle between two strands of Methodism. Between, on the one hand, primitivists, and on the other hand, Wesleyans. Now, I'm going to have to simplify this religious contest for the sake of time, but to put it very crudely, the primitivists stressed service to the poor and tended to find a home in the Labour Party. Mrs. Thatcher was a Wesleyan Methodist, and they tended to emphasize the doctrine of free will, and they gravitated towards the Conservative Party. Mrs. Thatcher believed very strongly in faith and charity, but she believed that if the government compelled us to be faithful or charitable, then it undermined free will, and therefore it compromised our very real choice to be good people. Ergo, Mrs. Thatcher tried to liberalize the rules on Sunday trading, the grocer's daughter might have spent her Sunday in church, but if someone else wanted to go to Sainsbury's on a Sunday, that was up to them. I should add at this point that like many members of her generation, Mrs. Thatcher was not adverse to New Age religion as well. This is surprising. Once every six weeks, Margaret Thatcher 
would get herself electrocuted by a Hindu. In 1989, <laughs> in 1989, an article published in Vanity Fair revealed that the Prime Minister of Great Britain and Northern Ireland would visit the flat of a Hindu practitioner called Lady Price, and that Lady Price would, quote, poach Mrs. Thatcher in herbs in a hot tub, <laughs> and then literally electrify her. Standing at the foot of the tub, Madame would turn the amps up to 0.3 on the baffle plates which lined the bath. And after an hour's electrification, she would rub down the Prime Minister's tingling body with natural flower oils. <laughs> this extraordinary fact was obviously known within Westminster because after a particularly difficult meeting with Mrs. Thatcher, one of her ministers was heard to joke, she must have had the full 240 volts this morning. <laughs> There was something rather naive about Mrs. Thatcher's attitudes towards religion and, pu and public life. Probably her greatest achievement was defeating socialism, forcing New Labour under Tony Blair to embrace capitalism and Mrs. Thatcher's brand of economics. But she had assumed that if you left people to their own devices, if you gave them free will and the right to choose to do whatever they want, that they would choose to be as bourgeois religious and as socially conservative as she undoubtedly was. But they didn't. Britain and the West embraced not just the economic liberalism of the right of Margaret Thatcher, but it also embraced the cultural liberalism of the left. And religion, social solidarity and tradition eroded in Britain and across the West. From 1997 to about 2016, Britain was governed by prime ministers who defined themselves in opposition to everything their parties had traditionally stood for. I'm ignoring the Gordon Brown interregnum in this. Tony Blair put private money into the public services and was quite relaxed about people becoming rich. David Cameron, a conservative, introduced gay marriage precisely, he said, because I am a conservative. Neither of these men had any intention of building heaven on earth. They reformed their societies but they did not seek to transform them. They were both managers of a post-Thatcher liberal consensus. 2019, and that consensus is now broken. The consensus has fallen almost as fast as communism did. Four years on from the 2015 general election, Labour is now led by, I think it's fair to call him in doctrinaire terms, a Marxist. And the Conservatives, a party traditionally defined by their aversion to risk is leading Britain out of the EU. I can tell you, as someone who's been in the Eurosceptic movement for some time, that in 2015, very few of us Eurosceptics ever thought Britain would leave the EU, and even fewer Eurosceptics actually thought that it should. The liberal consensus broke down for a very simple reason. You can only said to be managing a system if that system is seen to work and liberalism started to get glitches in the works, most notably the Iraq war and the credit crunch. Vote for us, said the liberals, because we might not be utopians, but we are at least competent. But when the global economy nosedived, this rather hubristic claim suddenly looked like a big fib. And the refusal of the liberal managers to change their policies in any significant way, in fact, they doubled down on capitalism with austerity and they went to war again in Libya and Syria, this doubling down persuaded some people that the managerialism of Blair and Cameron was in fact not just managerialism, but an ideology in and of itself. Patrick Deneen, the Catholic political scientist, puts it very well when he says that liberalism is one of the few ideologies that likes to pretend it isn't an ideology, and that it does a very good job of not being noticeable for much of the time. Like a computer system, he says, you only notice liberalism when it breaks down. And now we are at the beginning of a whole new political era, a post-liberal era. And what is striking, what's really remarkable to me, is the return of the collectivist ambition to build heaven on earth. We're back to heaven building again. Or to paraphrase Donald Trump, to make the earth great again. <laughs> you can see it... You can see it in the Green Movement, with its apocalyptic warning that the Earth is on the brink of destruction. Whether you believe in global warming or the Christian hell, 
Environmentalists and Christians both share the conviction that if we don't repent of our sins, things are going to get very hot very soon. <laughs> and there is a touch of religious zeal too in Jeremy Corbyn, a man who represents a return to that Methodist school of primitivism of the early 20th century. Only the other day, I was walking across Trafalgar Square and I came across a portrait of Mr. Corbyn that someone had drawn on the pavement in chalk. He was holding a book and giving a speech and looking skywards. It was the image not of a politician, but of a preacher in the pulpit. And this, I am convinced, is no coincidence. For Mr. Corbyn was a disciple of the late Tony Benn, who argued that Jesus was essentially the first socialist and that a long line flows almost seamlessly from Christ to the Reformation, to the Methodists, to the Labour Party with their ancient dream of building Jerusalem in England's green and pleasant land. When Mr. Corbyn speaks, one can almost hear the poetry of William Blake. When Boris Johnson speaks, I can hear the triumphant organ music of Hubert Parry, which used to accompany that hymn. Mr. Johnson is not by instinct a heaven builder. On the contrary, he is an individualist and a libertarian, and he has the private life to match. <laughs> but, but, by historical accident almost, he is the Prime Minister who has to deliver Brexit. And the only way to sell Brexit, with all its mind-numbing complexity, some of which is boring, some of which is depressing, the only way to sell Brexit is to tie it to a vision of national renewal. And so a man who really has a lot in common with Blair and Cameron, you might call Mr Johnson one of nature's liberals, finds himself having to sell to us a project of national renewal, financed not by tax cut and all those individualistic style policies, but financed by bigger state spending, with better controlled borders, and Britain going out into the world to fulfill its trading destiny as an island nation. It is as if in 2019 we are back in 1945. Labour is offering us socialism, the Conservatives are offering us rural Britannia. Either way, there is a sense that the nation needs to be rebuilt. And in order to do it, in order for it to be rebuilt and to build a new future, both parties are turning back to the country's past, which we find littered with Christian themes, such as sacrifice, charity, and hope. But what about the Christian theme of faith? What about faith? That's a bit more ambiguous. And this is the paradox that Christians face in 2019. <clears throat> At the very moment when our country is rediscovering its collectivist ambitions, all of which draw upon that past and are infused with Christian language and ideas, at the exact same time as this is happening, as Britain is looking back, the Christianity of belief and conviction has never felt more removed from the public sphere. It is as if Jesus is standing in the room, but no one recognises him. Or worse, they do recognise him, but they're embarrassed to see him, and they pretend not to know who he is. Of course, it would be wrong to say that Christianity is entirely excluded from modern, po modern politics. That's totally inaccurate. Pope Francis, for example, is an expressly political pope and has done many wonderful things in the fields of diplomacy and charity for refugees. And Pope Francis has written the greatest work of its time on environmentalism, the encyclical Laudato Si. <clears throat> In Laudato Si, His Holiness ties together theology and the Green Movement to prove beyond a doubt that Christian witness is timelessly relevant. But let's be honest, Christians enjoy influence when it comes to talking about the environment, because on that subject, we are pushing at an open door. When the Pope talks about abortion or gender or the family, the door is shut in his face. He is either ignored or condemned. Politicians in modern Britain judge Christianity not on its self-perceived truth, but on how useful it is to advance their own arguments. If it contradicts the political consensus, it suddenly becomes arcane, irrelevant, even hateful. In this general election, for example, a former Labour MP who was selected to fight a seat for the Lib Dems was unceremoniously dumped by the Lib Dems because he had opposed abortion and had in the past voted against the legalisation of same-sex marriage. And Tim Farron, who was the leader of the Lib Dems during the 2017 general election, had a notoriously difficult campaign when he was repeatedly hauled over the coals for his views on gay sex. To be clear, Mr Farron is a genuine liberal. His argument was always that whatever his personal view about homosexuality, the state should be entirely neutral on the matter. 
But this just wasn't good enough for the media, or probably, and this is important, for a very large number of voters. They insisted upon a leader who wasn't just unopposed to gay sex, but thoroughly in favour of it. Mr. Farron has since concluded that it is impossible to be both a political leader and a committed Christian. He has said, quote, <clears throat> If you actively hold a faith that is more than just an expression of cultural identity, you are deemed to be far worse than eccentric. You are dangerous. You are offensive. This perception of religion in politics is self-reinforcing. Because the door is open when we talk about poverty, few even notice that we have walked through that door. It's only when the door is shut in our face, usually on moral questions, that a fuss is made about Christian beliefs and people suddenly pay attention. What's distressing about this is that the attention paid to these controversies adds to the impression that Christians are absolutely obsessed about what people are doing in bed. Far from it. Nothing could be further from the truth. To take a random example, I have absolutely no desire to know what Tim Farron gets up to in the bedroom, be it socks on, lights off, or the height of erotic adventure. <laughs> what 21st century Britain would ideally like us to do is to bifurcate our religion, to separate doing nice things, like looking after the poor and the environment, from our views on personal morality and then either keep entirely, uh, entirely silent about our views on morality, or, even better, to put those views into the recycling bag and leave them outside the door. The problem is, is that this is simply not how religion works. You cannot separate out different bits of doctrine and keep the easy bits and disregard the difficult stuff. On the contrary, religious beliefs are always part of a whole package. These are not arbitrary rules. Each individual article of faith adds up to a coherent whole. For example, <clears throat> the same theology, the same understanding of life that drives most Christians' opposition to economic injustice also motivates their opposition to abortion. As the historian Tom Holland points out in his book Dominion, when Christianity first arrived in Rome, it challenged dramatically pagan attitudes regarding the value of human life. The Romans were really horrible people. If a Roman citizen gave birth to a child that was disabled or unwanted, and especially if that child was a girl, Romans didn't just think it was okay to let the baby die. They thought it was immoral to let it live. Romans would leave unwanted babies on rubbish tips or by the side of the road. The Christians, on the other hand, these balmy followers of this weird Jewish cult, Christians believe that we are all made in the image of God. So we are all equal. And this meant that all life was sacred, whether it was a baby girl, disabled, or even the greatest taboo of all, the child of slaves. Therefore, the Christians caused great scandal in Rome by going around picking up the babies that pagans had dropped. There are two things you need to understand about the social dimension of Christianity. Number one, it was, when it was founded, a revolutionary movement. Number two, it still is. Perhaps it is a sign of the failure of Christianity to change the West, but 2,000 years on from the birth of Christ, Jesus' teachings are still radical, still uncomfortable, and still completely contrary to the prevailing culture even after 2,000 years of percolating in Christian belief. In fact, I'd go so far as to say that there is a lot more about this society that is neo-pagan and somewhat similar to the society of the Romans. After all, we worship wealth. We invent all sorts of arguments to justify the greatest of depravities, we kill the unborn, and we've recently started to encourage suicide among the old and the infirm. The question is, the question I promised I would try to answer at the beginning of this talk, is do we Christians seek to change this social order through political means? Will that work? Now, there are some who say that Christians have no choice but to enter politics, if only to save their own skins. Some people feel that our society is becoming more and more intolerant of Christianity, and that unless we are inside the corridors of power, wielding influence, we are going to eventually feel the sting of persecution. 
As Ralph Nader said, you need to turn on to politics before politics turns on to you. Or to put it another way, if we Christians find ourselves suddenly cast into the lion's den, we face a choice. Do we want to be the lion tamers or do we want to become cat food? <laughs> Christianity is inherently political, as the gospel I read at the beginning, the gospel of John, shows. Jesus was not crucified because he was the son of God. He was crucified by the Roman Empire in order to keep the peace in one of its colonies because the local religious leadership thought Jesus was a heretic. And there was even a worrying possibility that Jesus was a nationalist. Jesus upended the classical moral order. He said that the first should come last and the last should come first. And he preached against materialism in the name of love. As the philosopher Alist uh, Alistair MacIntyre wrote in his 1968 work, Marxism and Christianity, Christians have never believed that charity ends at private acts of generosity. They have always believed that love demands that we challenge wider injustices. And that is why the Catholic Church has taken upon its shoulders the historic task of promoting the rights of women and the liberation of slaves. Social criticism, criticism of the established order, is an inherent part of Christian identity. But the interaction of Christianity and politics has always been a complicated thing because theology and politics work in very different ways. Let's look closer at that dialogue between Jesus and Pilate. To remind you, Pilate asks Jesus if he is a king, which is something Pilate can deal with. Jesus replies that he is a king, but not of this world. Were he a king of this world, then after all, he wouldn't be in chains. Pilate, with a loyally love of semantics, says, so you are a king then? It's starting to sound a bit like Andrew Neil interviewing him. <laughs> Jesus replies, you say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into this world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of the truth listens to me. And Pilate then says something that every politician can identify with. He asks, what is the truth? The Roman governor asked this question in Judea in the first century AD, but it is a question that is asked all the time in Britain in 2019. What is the truth? You see, if there is no one God, if our society has reached the conclusion that there is no one truth, there is your truth, my truth, as many truths as there are people, if that is the case, it actually starts to become difficult simply to have a conversation with each other. And the truth that politicians respect and the truth that they live by is whatever truth gives them power and helps them to keep power. The tragedy of Pilate is that he does in fact suspect the real truth. Pilate suspects that Jesus is innocent of what the local religious leaders accuse him of doing. After interrogating Jesus, Pilate says to the mob, I find no basis for a charge against him. But the mob replies, if you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. Pilate is then torn between loyalty to his conscience and loyalty to the Roman state, and the needs of the state win. So Pilate has Jesus crucified. At the same time, when he does that, he crucifies his own conscience, because that is what one does when one tells a lie. For 2,000 years, philosophers have explored the tension between this Christian notion of truth and the need for politicians to bend it in the service of themselves and the state. The argument could be boiled down to this. Jesus' kingdom might not be of this world, but earthly kingdoms obviously are, and they must function by very human rules in order just to keep going. Machiavelli, writing during the Renaissance, argued that bending the truth and being unchristian could actually be to the benefit of the people. For instance, if a ruler is too gentle and like Christ, then there will, be, there will undoubtedly be an uprising among his subjects, which can lead to anarchy and death. By contrast, if a leader is judiciously cruel, then he can provide a degree of stability that benefits the greater number of people. Writing in the 1930s, the French thinker Simone Weil argued that when Christians enter politics, their loyalty between their conscience and the state is necessarily divided and that if they're going to do their job well, the Christian politician will necessarily have to let the needs of the state come first. Weil was writing in the age of fascism and communism, but this logic applies to democracy today, and it's a real challenge to any Christian who wants to advance Christianity through the ballot box. 
In a democracy, an elected representative can only do what the people want or let them do. And the people might want parts of the Christian message, but we have to recognise that they don't actually want the whole thing. Recent referendums in Ireland, for instance, have resulted in overwhelming majorities for gay marriage and abortion. In America in 2016, the electorate, albeit narrowly, supported Donald Trump, a three times married man who bragged about assaulting women and has dubious business ethics. It was not uncommon to hear American conservatives saying something like, well, he might be a crook, but he is our crook. <laughs> Nowhere is the compromising effect of Christian engagement in politics more obvious than in the relationship between Donald Trump and American evangelicals. By embracing Donald Trump as enthusiastically as they have done, conservative evangelicals risk destroying their public reputation at least for a generation. Why? Because the tension is so painfully obvious between their claim to want a more godly America and Mr. Trump's vulgarity and right-wing populism. Mr. Trump has said, quote, nobody reads the Bible more than me, and he has also named the Bible as his second favourite book. <laughs> It was narrowly beaten by his autobiography. <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless, it is very hard to square whatever passes for the president's self-professed faith and his attitude towards, say, refugees. In the first two years of his administration, Donald Trump cut the number of Muslim refugees admitted into the United States by 93% compared to the final months of the Obama administration. Mr. Trump also cut the number of Christian refugees by 64%. If that sounds less, you have to put things in comparison and perspective when you look at the actual numbers. In the whole of the fiscal year of 2018, the number of Syrian Christians granted refuge in the United States numbered 20 to zero. On the other hand, even if Mr. Trump were a living saint, it's hard to second guess how he would actually deal with the complex problems of our age. The Bible does not offer a manifesto on how to manage a border. It certainly feels unchristian to deny shelter to anyone in need or to refuse to share our wealth with migrants. But even Bernie Sanders, the socialist senator from Vermont, described open borders as a right-wing policy because, he said, they were designed to flood the labour market and drive down wages. And that's not very Christian. And when migrants drown at sea or are found dead in the back of a lorry, you could say that that is an argument for opening the borders, but you could also argue that it proves the humanitarian case for keeping them closed. If people know that illegal immigrants will be automatically deported, they'll be less likely to take terrible risks to get to rich countries, and the business for people smugglers will dry up. Whatever the truth of what God wants, Donald Trump feels that his immediate obligation is to the Americans who voted for him. And I hate to sound like a broken clock, but to repeat, in our democratic system, he's sort of right. It is odd to imagine that a president would be elected by the American people and would then throw open the borders to the entire world to enter his country. Such an action would destroy faith in democracy and would lead to exactly the kind of crisis and political legitimacy that put Mr. Trump in office in the first place. Trust is turning into the biggest issue of this general election in Britain too. Labour says that you can't trust Boris Johnson. Mr. Johnson says that the only way to restore trust is to honour the Brexit referendum. My fundamental point is this. When Tim Farron says that it is difficult to be a committed Christian and a political leader, it is not only difficult because of the anti-Christian prejudice of modern Britain, it is also difficult because the Christian seeks a relationship with the truth, with a capital T, that puts the Christian at odds with society and also at odds with the political process. Christians are not supposed to be led by their own ego or the demands of a democratic majority. They are supposed to adhere to their conscience, the conscience that they believe is a gift from God. As is probably obvious from everything I have said, I am not 100% sure what the correct relationship between Christians and politics is, but I can offer three small bits of advice. The first is for Christians in public life to be honest. The notion that one can separate faith and politics is impossible and silly. If you have a faith, and if that faith is worth anything, then it defines literally everything you do. Therefore, the Christian must approach the public with a health warning. 
if you people vote for me, you're going to get some religion. If we hide our faith from the public or we are cagey about it, then we legitimise the idea that faith doesn't belong in public or as an embarrassment. Some felt that the real reason why Mr Farron's leadership imploded in 2017 wasn't that he was too open about his faith, but that he seemed awkward when discussing it. He was caught on the back foot, and that was a mistake. People might disagree with an honest man, but they generally respect him, and they are uneasy around those who are excessively guarded. Second, if you go into politics as a Christian, make sure you are a Christian politician. That means be Christian in how you practice your politics. Be kind. Don't rush to judge. Be a model of the faith, because if, even if you don't feel like you're much of a Christian, just saying, I am a Christian in 2019, is so unusual and exceptional that it will define you that way, and people will judge other Christians by how you behave. This society might be sceptical about Christianity, but, as I said, we are on the verge of a collectivist turn in our politics, of a rising desire to build a better country, sometimes, paradoxically for a neo-pagan country, uh, to build a better country in a way that taps into memories of Christianity. And that gives us a wonderful opportunity to contribute to this moment. We can help to make British society more aware of the religious roots of its freedoms. We can challenge the liberal consensus around so much of social policy, particularly the treatment of the unborn and the decline in the interests of the family. We can make the case not only for a more generous Britain, but also try to stem any cruelty. Collectivist ambitions can easily become authoritarian, and we've all noticed an intolerance in modern Britain towards opposing views in both the Leave and the Remain camps. Christians must make the case for remembering that we are all made in God's image. Finally, Christians can help to reconcile people to what the state cannot do. There is a tension in the modern world between the extreme individualism of our culture and the belief that the individual not only can do whatever they want, but they have a right to do it. And thus, whenever the individual fails to do what they want, it is the duty of the state to step in and help them to do it. This is madness. Oh, the state can provide you with a safety net, and the state can give you some of the tools for success, but it cannot replace a loving mother or father. It cannot get you off drugs. It cannot teach you the violin. It cannot lift your depression. It cannot ease your grief for a lost pet. The state, in short, cannot love you. It can just about issue a passport, but even that is likely to get lost in the post. <laughs> for Christians, this awareness of limits is not an excuse for greed or tolerating injustice. The opposite is true. It is a challenge. Responsibility lies with the individual to fix things and never underestimate the power of even the smallest act of charity. I know the state has done many wonderful things for me. I am the product of the NHS and the state school, and I've also been on the dole. But let's be honest, these things usually take place invisibly. We take them for granted, probably far too much. But what does touch us in everyday life are individual acts of kindness. And so often just a smile or a hello is revolutionary and transformative and life-saving. I always think of the wonderful comedian Julian Clary, who once became so horribly depressed that he decided to end it all. He booked himself into the Intercontinental Hotel with the intention of taking an overdose of sleeping pills. But the minibar was so engrossing and the room service was so pleasant that he thought, I think I'll wait till morning. <laughs> and then when he woke up the next day after having had such a nice time, he realised how horrible it would be if the poor old chambermaid found his body, so he decided he wouldn't go through with it after all. <laughs> poor Mr Clary. He is broken, but the point is that we are all broken together. And although living in a society can drive us mad, it can also save us and be our redemption. And that is the starting point for a healthy, better politics, an attempt to work together to make life a little bit better, and to reassure people that they must not despair but always have hope. Thank you. <laughs>